Yes, sir. Next Sunday is Christmas at People's Church. We will have specialty coffee drinks, and word is out that Starbucks discontinued the eggnog latte. So anybody that you know, love, like no offense to my Starbucks, that's just what I heard, okay? And so we will have eggnog lattes next week. So if you like the eggnog, I'm not a big eggnog fan. Pastor Herbert tried. He tried. He tried to convince me. It just didn't work. But I will do an eggnog latte. Nonetheless, next Sunday, Christmas Sunday, specialty coffee drinks. We'll be doing baby dedications. If you have a baby, want to get them dedicated, we would be so honored to do that. You can sign up in the lobby. We're having water baptisms. If you haven't been water baptized yet, you can sign up in the lobby for that. We're going to have a special Christmas performance, music performance. And so uh, when you came in on your chair were these invite cards. Man, would you make them personal? Would you grab the stack that was on your chair and would you hand out every single one of them? I heard from one of our attenders, they were at work and they've been praying about who to invite and, and finally they felt like the Lord gave them direction and so they went up like, hey, I want to invite you to my church and gave them the card and out of nowhere, two other coworkers popped out and were like, hey, what's that? What, what's, what's, what's that? What's going on? And they were like, well, let me tell you, hey, and then he handed out two more. I want you to come to my church. And so, listen, he went for one invite, and he got three. Come on, somebody. Said he's following up with them this week. That's how you do it. You invite, you follow up. Hey, I hope to see you. I know my son is inviting some people. I'm going to an event after church where y'all be, come on, be handing them out, passing them out, inviting a bunch of people. And so would you invite, invite, invite. It's a great opportunity for people to come, hear the gospel, to hear the message uh, of hope for Christmas at People's Church, and so that is next Sunday. And then also want to remind you about our Christmas Eve services. If you could just pull out your phone, go ahead, pull out your phone, it's okay. Pull out your phone and take a picture. Take a picture of our services and times. We're doing candlelight Christmas services three different times, the 23rd at 7 p.m., and then on the 24th at 3 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Listen, you have people in your life friends, co-workers, families, they will not come to church on a regular Sunday, but they will come for Christmas Eve. Studies have shown Christmas Eve is just one of those events where people will come. Matter of fact, there's somebody in the church, they asked me, they said, Pastor, I have some unsaved uh, folks that I'm, I want to bring. What, what would be better? Should I bring them on the 19th or should I bring them on Christmas Eve? Listen, here at People's Church, every Sunday we give people an opportunity to receive Christ. Every Sunday. Every, you will never find a Sunday where we don't, I know some of you are like, I don't know what you do at the, nine, at the 1230, Pastor Chris. I mean, I know you do it at the 11, but what if I bring him to the 1230? We give a salvation altar call. What if I bring him to the 930? We give a salvation every single service, every Sunday, because we know people need Jesus. He is the hope of the world. And so I know you're wondering, you're like, so which service did you tell them? Which one did you tell them? I said both of them. Either one will work, whichever one they can come to, because at both of them, we're going to present the message of hope, the gospel, and we give people an opportunity to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. So text and invite, and I'm excited. My heart is filled with excitement to see what God is going to do. Lives are going to be changed. People saved through Christmas at People's Church on the 19th and our Christmas Eve services. So would you be praying? Let's be inviting and praying all together. Amen? Amen. Well, today we are continuing our series called Till He Appeared. And we looked at a verse in Isaiah that gives some names of what appeared when Jesus appeared. And, and last week, Pastor Herbert talked about one of those names, that, that, that when Jesus appeared, a mighty God appeared, that he's mighty to save, mighty to heal, mighty to set free, and mighty to provide. And this week... We're going to look at that verse again, Isaiah chapter 9, 6, and we're going to focus on another name, but I want to share that verse with you, Isaiah 9, 6. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And today we're going to focus on on Jesus being our wonderful counselor. 
our wonderful counsel. I'm curious, has anybody in the room ever been given good counsel? Has anybody been given some good advice? All right. Has anybody in the room ever been given some bad counsel? Anybody ever been given some bad advice? I think we all can experience that. Have you ever been given some counsel where you just kind of scratched your head? You're like, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel about that counsel. I, I found some counsel that I thought was a bit head scratching. Check, check out this first picture here. This is a, a, a box of Fruit Loops cereal. And if you look at the very bottom of the paragraph, it says, wash thoroughly before use. Um, just does anybody else wash their Fruit Loops? I've never washed my. I mean, I wash them with milk. You know what I mean? I wash them down with some milk. But if you didn't know that, I guess you better start washing your Fruit Loops. I thought that was a head scratcher. How about check out this next one? <clears throat> Caution: Please be aware that the balcony is not on ground level. There were obviously some folks that didn't realize that, and they thought, well, we better, we better give some good counsel, because not everybody realizes the balcony is not on the ground level. Ch check out this next one. Oh, the iPod shuffle. Everybody, anybody own a shuffle? Everybody remember a shuffle back in the day, had a little shuffle? I want you to focus on number two there. Do not eat the iPod Shuffle. Some blessed soul obviously thought that you could eat. Maybe they thought, I was thinking of, like, what would cost somebody to eat? Maybe they were a really bad singer, and they thought, oh, if I eat the iPod Shuffle, that'll help me sing good. You know what I mean? They're like, but, but before they ate it, you know, they're singing. They're like, uh, you know, but then all of a sudden they ate the iPod Shuffle, and then they're like, oh, woo, 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 woo. I mean, maybe they thought... That was going to, I, I, I don't not know, but man, that definitely made me scratch my, that was a head scratcher there. So let's look at the next one here. This is an industrial uh, a washer, all right, uh, for clothes. It says, do not put any person in this washer. This is not a shower, okay? This is meant for clothes. I'm like, my goodness. High spin speeds. I think that's what, what got somebody. They're like, I just have to see how high those speeds are, and they decided to jump in. Do not put any. I, I, I like this next one. If we got any new parents or those expecting, here you go. Checking baby's diaper. <laughs> yes and no. Oh, yeah, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Matter of fact, I, my, my, my wife let me know last night that my son Cohen left me a gift I'm so sorry, honey. I had to leave. And he was, to be honest, she changes most of them. So any chance she gets, she puts them on me. And y'all, I'm doing the shirt check. Like, I'm not, I'm not even putting my hand back there to make sure nothing's, if you're a parent, you know. If you don't, you will someday. And, uh, and then I thought this last one was funny. Check out this last one. This is a hair dryer. Do not use while sleeping, okay? I listen, I know some of us like to multitask. That is not the way to do it. Can you imagine they must have propped it up and figure, well, hey, I'll just have my hair dry while I'm sleeping. That is not a good idea. We all have received and given good counsel. We all have received and given Bad advice, bad counsel. Some of us, we received counsel, saved our job, maybe saved a relationship. Others of us, we've received some counsel, it caused us to lose our job, hurt the relationship. We all can relate to this. And Isaiah lists four names of Jesus in the Old Testament 700 years before his birth. And it was during the season, there was a lot of turmoil and fear in the nation, and one of those names is Wonderful Counselor. These two English words, wonderful counselor, they come from two Hebrew words. Hebrew was the primary language spoken and written in the Old Testament. And wonderful in the Hebrew, it means beyond understanding. Too wonderful for words. That's who Jesus is, what he does. It's beyond under, too wonderful for words. And counselor means to advise. His advice, his counsel, his guidance is too wonderful 
for words. In other words, one day a son will be born from God. He'll be given to us, God in the flesh. He'll be the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He'll guide you, care for you, ex understand exactly what you're going through. He'll listen to you, advise you, and he'll heal your deepest hurts. That's what makes him a wonderful counselor. I love the way Jesus is described in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Jesus, he's the wonderful counselor. He understands everything we're feeling, everything that we've gone through, yet he did not sin. And in verse 16, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may have we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The good news is there is one who understands our need. And let's be honest, there's a lot of need in our world. There's a lot of need in our city, in our families, in our schools. I'm sure every single one of us in our lives, there are needs. You may be in a significant time of need today. And the good news is there is a wonderful counselor who can help, and his name is Jesus. And so we're going to look at a story today in the Bible, how Jesus the wonderful counselor can heal and meet your needs, meet you in your time of need. The story is found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 through 34, and we find two men that are in need. And the wonderful counselor, he helped them in their time of need. He, he appeared, and they took advantage of it. They, they took four steps, and the wonderful counselor, he healed them. And listen, he wants to do the same for you today. And so I want to share these four steps because I believe they will lead to healing, and they will lead to the wonderful counselor helping you. The first step is this. You have to cry out to the wonderful counselor. Let's look at the story, Matthew chapter 20, verse 29. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Everywhere Jesus and his disciples went, there were these massive crowds just wanting to get to Jesus and hear from Jesus. His, his reputation preceded him everywhere he went, and so they would go to him. And in verse 30, so there's this massive crowd following Jesus, and in verse 30, it says, two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Two blind men were in need of a miracle. And they heard that Jesus was close by and they cried out to the wonderful counselor. See, if we look closely enough in this story, we'll see that these two men represent you and me. That these two men in need of a miracle is us. And you may think, what are we talking about, Pastor? I'm, I'm not blind. Listen, you don't, you don't have to be physically blind to know and have experienced situations that you can't see. Let me explain. Some of you in here, you can't see how you're going to get out of debt. Some of you, you can't see how the relationship is going to be restored. You can't see how you're going to shake and overcome the addiction. You can't see how you're going to be free. You can't see how the pain is going to leave. You can't see how God could ever forgive you. You can't see how God wants to use your story to make a difference. You can't see how you're going to build that business, or you can't see how in the world you're going to get through college, or you can't see how your marriage can get better, how your child can be healed, how your family can be saved and restored. See, we all have experienced blindness. But look at what these men did, verse 30. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted. I want you to catch this. They didn't allow what wasn't working to stop them from using what was working. 
Their ears were working and their mouth was working. And so when they heard, they shouted. They cried out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy. Listen, no matter what situation you are in, the wonderful counselor, he is near and he will hear your cry. You just have to cry for him to hear it. And that's what these men did. It wasn't polite. It wasn't, uh, uh, excuse me, hey, Jesus, we're over here. Pardon moi. No, 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 no. It was loud. It was dusty. There was a crowd. They're sitting on the ground. I'm sure dust is on their face. And all of a sudden they hear Jesus and they have been blind. And listen, all they knew is Jesus heals. Listen, there were no surgeons in that time. There were no cornea transplants. There were no eye doctors. They, they, they knew Jesus was there and he was it. And he healed. And so they cried out to him. They took advantage of it. The wonderful counselor was coming and they cried out, son of David, help us. Listen, you got to cry out for healing. Cry out for peace. Cry out to Jesus for favor. Cry out to Jesus for comfort. Cry out to Jesus for restoration. Cry out to Jesus for the salvation of your love. He hears you. Cry out to him for your marriage and your family and your children and your health and your finances. Listen, Jesus, he hears your cry. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 17 and 18. It says, the the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed to spirit. Listen, you got to cry out to him. He hasn't forgotten about you. Oftentimes we forget about him and who he is, that he's a healer, a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. Don't you forget who he is and you cry out and you call out to the Lord for your situation because he's the wonderful counselor. Now listen. When you start to cry out, when you start to press in, when you start to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go after Jesus. I'm going to get close to him. I'm going to cry out to the wonderful counselor, the, the, the healer, the way maker. Listen, when you start to do that, listen, you're going to come up against some opposition. See, the two blind men, they cried out to God, and the Bible says the crowd rebuked them. But this is my second step, second point today. You have to ignore the counsel of the crowd. Ignore the counsel of the crowd. Look back at the story, Matthew 20, verse 31, that they cried out, and it says the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder. They ignored the crowd. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. You see, when you get serious about Jesus, when you get a vision for who he is and what he wants to do in your life and you start crying out to him, you will have some people that will try to give you poor counsel. They'll rebuke you. They'll tell you to be quiet. They'll look at you like you're crazy. Don't leave Jesus. I mean, they will... And you got to ignore. They'll be like, why are you going to church? <laughs> church can't help you. They'll, be, they'll look at you like, you're serving at church? You spend two to three hours at church? Man, you think that's going to help your life? Oh, you're going to fast. What's fasting? You're not going to eat for 21 days. And you're going to go to 6 a.m. prayer? That's extreme. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what's going on at church church. I don't know what they're doing over there. I'm talking about not eating fasting for 21 days, and you, you're going to 6 a.m. prayer. Like, that's, that's silly. You started tithing, and you gave in a miracle offering? That's ridiculous. You think that's going to help you with your finances? What are you? What you, what you got there? Oh, it's a, oh, you got a Bible? Oh, you're reading the Bible. Hmm, okay. Hey, man, we still on for Tuesday trivia night? Small group? What's a small group? Oh, oh, now you're too good, huh? Oh, no, you're reading your Bible, going to church, serving. You can't come to Tuesday trivia night because you're in your small group. I don't want to go to your small group. I don't know what a small group is. That's weird. 
small group. Like, we were supposed to be boys, or we were supposed to be girls. Like, what are you talking about a small group? What, what, what do you mean we can't go to the club anymore? I mean, they will, you, listen, you start trying to live holy and cry and live for God. What do you mean we can't hook up anymore? What do you mean we can't live together anymore? Like, what are you talking about? Like, like hold on, like, well, 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 what do you mean you can't go to the party anymore? You're my drinking buddy. I can't go drinking by myself. What do you mean? Are you, are you all church and holy? you crying out to God? Or, oh, oh, you're not going to get high in him. Man, you better stop that. You better come on and let's light it up. Well, what are you, you're going to, you're going to Christian marriage counseling? Oh, please. Listen, it's over. Look, file the divorce papers. Start over. Listen, she's no good for you. He's no good for you. That's not going to help. You just need to start a, oh, oh, you trying to watch your language and quit cussing. We'll see how long that works. And you got some folks that will doubt you, question you. You got to ignore the counsel of the crowd. I remember when I got saved and I told my friends I couldn't go partying anymore. They were like, what? Man, stop it. I'm like, no, for real. And that's some of them get mad at me. Some of them make fun of me. I remember when I... So my friends, I was going to quit cussing, and they just thought that was ridiculous. They thought that was silly. I remember after I got saved, I made a commitment that I was going to save myself till, till marriage. There were even some Christian folks that are like, listen, you at least got to test drive the car before you drive it. You better ignore the crowd, ignore the counsel. I remember sitting down with the financial advisor, and he saw how much I was giving to the church. He was like, that's a lot. You sure you want to be? Yes, I am. Looks like I need a new financial advisor. But you got to ignore the crowd. You got to ignore the counsel of the crowd, and you got to listen to the wonderful counselor. Paul says this about the wonderful counselor in Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God has begun a good work, and he will finish it. Those men cried out to God, and they said, You need to be quiet. They said, whatever. They cried out even louder. They pressed past the crowd. You let the naysayers and criticizers say what they want. We look to Jesus, the wonderful counselor, and we got to persist and persevere even under pressure. You got to ignore the counsel of the crowd. And then number three, communicate your need to the wonderful counselor. Look at Matthew 20, verse 32 through 33. Jesus stopped and called them. He said, what? Do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. See, these guys got right to the point. Jesus said, what do you want? I'm sure a lot of folks thought they would have asked for money because they were on the road. They were begging. They were looking for alms. They could have been like, well, I'm going to be blind my entire life, so I might as well just ask for something else. But no, no, no. They asked something very specific. They said, Jesus, I want to see. I want you to open my eyes. I want to see my family. I want to see my kids. I want to see my wife for the first time. I, I want to see you, Jesus. I want to see the crowds. I want to see the sunset. I want to see the oceans. I, I want to see the waves. Open my eyes. See, for some of you today, you simply need to ask God and be specific. Look, Matthew 7, verse 7 through 8. Listen, there's no prayer that is too big for God. Ask him about everything. The Bible, Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Tell Jesus what you want him to do for you. Can you imagine going to the hospital and you got a broken leg and like the bone is sticking out and the doctor walks in and he's like, well, what would you like me to do for you? Well, you see, last week I got this splinter in my finger. Could you? See, you know what happens? Sometimes we're afraid to ask God big prayers. We think we're not worthy. Or we think that's just the way it is. Well, I've just, I've always been blind. So I, let, me, let me ask for something else. No, no. Listen, would you pray big, bold, sp and specific prayers? Sometimes we, we just go through the motions. Lord, bless me. And that's a good prayer, but how do you want God to bless you? Be specific. God, help me. God, use me. How? 
help. Be, be specific about how you want him to help him. Be specific about how you want God to use you. Be specific. He does not mind your specific, big, bold prayers. He wants you to, there is no prayer that is too big for God. Pray over it. Pray. Listen, ask God to help you forgive that person and say their name. Don't just say, God, just help me to forgive. Get specific. Get specific about the person. Get specific about the situation. Come on, get specific. Pray for God to bless your finances and your business. God, I want to be blessed so I can be a blessed. Pray over your unsafe family members. Pray for them by name. Pray for your children by name. Pray specifically over them and their situation. Pray specifically over your marriage and the situation. Pray specific prayers when you need healing. What you need healed, be specific. We need to be specific when we pray because God cares. Jesus cares. Look at 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. All in the Greek means all. It means all. It means everything. Big, small, everything in between. Cast it on God. Ask him because he cares for you. Literally because you are of great concern to him. God says, whatever is of concern to you is of concern to me because I love you. If it's your marriage, your kids, your finances, your future, your family, your health, if that's of great concern to you, it is of great concern to me. So we got to cry out to Jesus. we got to ignore the counsel of the crowd. Communicate your need. Be specific. And lastly, number four is follow the wonderful counselor. Follow the wonderful counselor. Look at Matthew 20, verse 34. It said, Jesus had compassion on them, and he touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. Listen, don't miss this. We can get so caught up in the miracle that we miss two of the most important words in this scripture. That after they were healed, they followed him. Everyone say follow him. He is the wonderful counselor. He is not afraid to, to, to put his compassionate touch on any area of your life. He wants to bless you and to heal you and to help you. But, but listen, listen, when he does it, listen, follow him. Follow him. When I gave my life to Jesus, he saved me. I was broken. I was lost. I was hurting in so many different ways. And when I finally found that hope, when I finally found Jesus, I made up my mind for good, bad, or ugly, I'm following him. I have found the way. It is Jesus, and I'm following him. On the good days, I'm following him. On the bad days, I'm following. And there were times where it was a challenge and a struggle, and I said, Jesus, I'm just following you. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the wonderful counselor. But you know what I see happen so often? It breaks my heart as a pastor. As I see so many people, they're desperate, hurting, need healing, need hope, need forgiveness, need a breakthrough. And they come to Jesus. They cry out. They come to church. They start to press in. And then what I see happen so often is that after they received the blessing, the healing. Once things start to get a little better, they stop following him. They stop following him. And then they end up again broken, hurting, lost. With some, it's even a vicious cycle. They'll come back, and things will start to be good. And they stop following. Don't stop. And some of you are here today. And listen, God's going to touch you. He's going to heal. You know how you keep that favor, keep that blessing, keep that protection. It's following him. It's not going to be all perfect, but follow him. He's the wonderful counselor. Don't get distracted by the crowd. Don't get distracted by your own knowledge in your own head and get in your head and think, okay, now I'm good. So now I'm just going to go and do my own thing. No, 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 no. You keep following Jesus every day, every morning, every night, every year, every month until your last dying breath.
breath. You follow him. You follow him. You follow the wonderful counselor because his, too, his counselor is, is too wonderful for words. He's got you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll carry you. But you got to follow him. You got to follow him. You got to follow him. If I could have everybody just stand, if you all just stand, just stand across the room and if you'll just kind of close your eyes with me. You know, God started speaking to me about this story. And we get to see how these two men that were blind called out when they heard Jesus was near. Because they were blind and they wanted to be healed. And God said this to me. He said, Chris, think about the people that were there, blind, hopeless, and they decided to just let Jesus walk on by. They decided to let their healing walk on by, their hope walk on by, their forgiveness. See, I can imagine it was uncomfortable for these two blind men to call out to shout even louder after the crowd rebuked them. And I wonder about the people who missed out on the breakthrough because they didn't want to be uncomfortable. I believe some of you in this room, there's some things you can't see. You can't see how the healing is going to take place. You could easily be like, the blind, we've always been blind, it's just always going to be that way. You could just be like, it's always going to be that way. The hurt's always going to be there. The pain, the, it's always going to be this way. It's always going to be this way. And I want you to know God wants to heal you. He wants to do a great and mighty work, but you got to cry out. You got to be willing to get a little bit uncomfortable. And so I'm asking you right now, would you be willing to get a little uncomfortable? Would you be willing to cry out to God? We're going to sing this song, Great Are You, Great Are You, Lord. And I want you to know He is great to heal. He is great to deliver. He is great to answer any need, any prayer, anything that you're going through right now. Come on, if you got some things you can't see right now and you need Jesus to touch you the way He touched these blind men, would you just lift your hands right now to heaven? Would you get a little uncomfortable. Maybe you've never lifted your hands. Would you get a little uncomfortable and lift your hands to heaven? As we sing this song, come on, worship is a way that we cry out. Worship is a cry to God. It's singing out to God. It's calling out to Him. As we sing this song, come on, would you sing and would you get a little uncomfortable and our great, wonderful counselor, He's going to bring healing. He's going to bring hope. He's going to bring breakthrough, deliverance. Father God, we're crying we're crying out. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Come on, press in. Press in. Lord, I bring healing in this room. Deliverance. Breakthrough. Help us see. Help us see. Heal our blindness. Heal us, Lord. Oh, 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 oh,
God, I thank you for healing. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you that you're helping people see. I thank you that people's faith is being lifted and restored. I pray that people are making a decision, God. We're going to cry out, God, every day tomorrow morning when we wake up in our bedroom, in our prayer closet. God, we're going to cry out. When we drive to work, we're going to cry out. When we pray over our kids, we're going to cry out. When we pray with our spouse, we're going to cry out. When we pray over the sick, we're going to cry out. When we pray over those that are lost and bound by addiction, we're going to cry out, God. Give us a spirit to get out of our comfort zone and say, Jesus, wonderful counselor, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. And Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the work that you're doing. I thank you. I thank you, Father, that you are the wonderful counselor. We praise you, Lord. 